so far. It's great to see you all. And thanks for, to those who joined us on YouTube. We're delighted to be continuing the conversation around the coronavirus and the COVID-19 vaccines. And, and this morning, Dr. Ngozi Adiosagi will be hosting Dr. Kate Oga and Dr. Dami, you know, and so I will hand over to, you know, Dr. Ngozi to do the introductions. We might have other doctors joining us just to, you know, provide any support, but over to you, Dr. Ngozi. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you again. And thanks for dialing in to our health hour. Um, well, you know, as you've been seeing on the news and in the papers and everywhere, really, social media, there's still a lot to talk about about COVID. And today we are going to look at aspects that perhaps are not as clearly explained in the media. And you've got an opportunity today to ask your one-on-one -on -one questions of two experts. And they're experts that if you go into hospital, you might not see, they're not on the front line, but they do really, really important jobs in the back offices. So we've got Dr. Kate Ogger, who's a microbiologist and she works at Lancaster. And she's going to explain about testing. So when you have a coronavirus test, you've heard of all the different tests. She's going to explain to us what that is. So when they say do the lateral flow test, what does that mean? Um, and we think that's important for you to know as well. And also we've got Dr. Dami Pinero, who's a postdoctoral immunologist who works at Imperial College in London. So I'm first of all going to hand over to Dami, who's going to talk to us about the different types of vaccines. So this is your opportunity. Start putting your questions in the chat. And when we have a break, you can also ask your questions directly of our two experts today. So thanks once again for joining us. Over to you, Dami. Oh, hello, um, thank you for having me to speak today. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Wait a minute, hopefully this will work. Right, to tell me if you can see the slides. We can see the slides, Dami. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 vaccines this morning. Um, I just thought I'd start with a brief um, background. So let's see if I can see my slides. So as we're all kind of aware, the late 2019 this new coronavirus emerged, uh, SARS-CoV-2, and it was the causative agent of the pandemic that we're now living through. And SARS-CoV-2 infection leads to the disease um, COVID-19, which was really first identified as a respiratory illness. But as time has gone on, it's become more apparent that it affects other areas. So there's complications such as with um, the heart, um, there can be neurological um, issues, and also really it affects the kidneys. Um, whilst in most um, of the sort of body at large, it presents as like a cold, like flu-like illness in at-risk groups, it can lead um, to sort of pneumonia, other complications, and sadly, unfortunately, death. Um, risk factors have been identified, and so the main uh, risk factors at the moment are age, so people over 70 seem to be particularly vulnerable, Gender can be considered a risk factor, and um, males are more at risk. And also the presence of underlying health issues such as diabetes, kidney diseases, and immune deficiencies such as sickle cell um, also seem to predispose to more complications and severe disease. So following on from lots of work in um, 2020, a COVID-19 vaccination program has started being rolled out towards the end of December and is ongoing now when I'm sure if you're following the news you're hearing large numbers are now being vaccinated in a uh, hope of like managing this um, disease and so I sort of want to take this opportunity to kind of discuss a couple of terms go through vaccination why it's important and the different types of vaccines and then kind of address a guess at the end um, and lay concerns about has the process been sped up kind of why, why we're here and why it's safe to take these vaccines. So um, I thought I'd start by introducing sort of two key um, concepts. And the first is to sort of talk about the difference between natural infection and vaccination because I'm sure all these terms are used. So natural infection is where an individual is infected by either a virus in the case of COVID-19 or 
um, bacteria in sort of day-to-day -day life and your body will mount an immune response and hopefully this means you'll, you'll, you'll have immune cells that will, will clear this infection and you'll be left with an immune memory so that when you then are infected again or come across this infection again, your immune response is primed and ready to fight it. And it's usually this response is faster and a little bit um, better than the first point of natural infection. Now, vaccination is where an individual is given a vaccine which contains a harmless form of the bacteria or virus. And so the body will mount an immune response to death and you will get that immune memory form, which is really key because it's very important for later and later infections, but you are not infected in this sort of scenario. You've just been exposed to the virus and this or bacteria and this allows you to mount the immune response. And again, this is really important because when you then go on to get natural infection, you've effectively trained your immune response to deal with that pathogen, deal with that virus or bacteria, and it can get to work much quicker on clearing it and getting you back to health. So I'm going to try and uh, talk through this, um, this slide here. And this is really addressing like COVID-19 and long-term immunity and sort of why the vaccine is important. So as I mentioned earlier, vaccines train your immune system using this harmless form. And what it's really important is that it works on um, your adaptive immune response. And this comes into two parts. So you might have heard these terms in discussion. So you'll have your B cells that allow you to make a highly specific antibody response to the virus and sort of stop it getting into your cells. And then you have a secondary arm, which is the T cells. And these can either help stimulate the B cells or help them to produce really good antibodies, or they can kill any infected cells. And so these, these sort of two arms of the adaptive immune response are really key to clearing an infection and recovering. And then what happens is that the cells remember the virus and remain in the body. And this is known as immune memory. So that if you then go on to have a natural infection, in the future, your immune system will respond much faster and is more effective sort of preventing the infection. And this is known as long-term immunity. And this is kind of what we want to, to gain. And we know that an effective um, COVID-19 uh, vaccine will produce a strong uh, long-term adaptive immune response. And it could either be B cell based with antibodies or T cells or a combination of both. And I'm sort of sure that you're aware from reports in the um, in the press that one of the ways that people sort of track long-term immune response is to look at your antibody uh, titer to see if you're still producing antibodies kind of, uh, months, if those months are, if antibodies are present months later. So the other kind of concept that I wanted to touch on, which I'm again sure has been mentioned, is herd or community immunity. And I'm basically just going to give a really simplified version. And this is where a large part of the population of an area is immune to a specific disease. And so if enough people are resistant to the virus, it will have nowhere to go. So we know that when the pandemic emerged, it was a completely new virus and it just spread through the population in terms of natural infection. And it became quite dangerous because of the, the burden it had on the healthcare and also in terms of loss of life. So although we've reached the point where there's um, more sort of immunity because more people are um, have been exposed to the virus. We're not quite at the point of herd immunity. And I really kind of want to get the idea that this is like a, a, a destination, not a journey. We will reach a point where most people in the country, in the world, will have some form of immunity to SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. And at that point, sort of the pandemic or the localised epidemics will begin to stop. So I thought I would sort of talk through um, this slide. It's a little bit old, but it really helps illustrate the idea and it kind of touches on herd immunity and social distancing. So if we look at the first slide, so this is kind of where we were last year, where we were at the onset of infection. And so red individuals are infected, blue are healthy, and you know, we, we don't have social distancing. And what we're seeing is the infection passes freely among the individuals, there's large spread, we know that certain parts of the population are quite vulnerable. So the end outcome is that we have some people who have natural sort of immunity, they've acquired immunity, and then there's death, quite large widespread death. 
So the scenario where we are now, which I guess is kind of in lockdown with the social distancing, is that you then start to separate people to slow the spread. So you still have effectively a naive population where the disease is spreading, um, but you're, you're able to contain it. And then in this scenario, you end up with people who have, again, some immunity, but there's actually quite a lot of people who aren't, but you, you've minimized the death. So now vaccination, now that we have a vaccine strategy, we're really at the, the bottom point, which is the best point we could hope to be at this time in that some people are vaccinated. So the infection cannot spread as freely among individuals. So it's easier to keep vulnerable populations um, safe. In, this, in our case here, vulnerable people are actually being vaccinated first. And then when you get out to the, the final outcome, um, you see that there are more people with immunity. So this will be a mixture of people of natural infection, but mostly vaccine driven immunity, uh, less death. And um, herd immunity is important because it keeps vulnerable people safe, right? But more importantly, um, vaccination is also really key to this because it keeps you safe, it keeps your family safe and it keeps others safe. Um, and so now I'm gonna talk a little bit further about what the difference types of vaccines are that are, are available. So I'm going to start with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which I'm sure if people have been offered, they might have come across it. Um, and this is what's known as a viral vector vaccine. And so this uses an unrelated harmless virus that has been modified to deliver the genetic material of SARS-CoV-2 and is known as a viral vector. And I think in, um, it's, a, it's a harmless sort of kind of cold virus in the case of the AstraZeneca. We then um, introduce it and the cells take it up and they begin to make the specific SARS-CoV-2 protein, so unique to the virus, and this will trigger an immune response. And as I mentioned earlier, the B cells and T cells will see this, they'll build memory, that when you then come across it in a natural infection scenario, you'll be able to respond quickly. You've trained your immune response. So in terms of this vaccine, where it's, why it's kind of good is that it generates a strong immune response, which is what you would like, and it can be stored at specific low temperatures. So I believe this can be refrigerated, which is good for supply chains and, and getting to areas where it might be difficult to get a vaccine. So in use, specifically for COVID is AstraZeneca Oxford um, vaccine or Ebola vaccine. And then there are some other um, second generation vaccines that are currently going to come out later in the year, such as I believe the Johnson uh, type vaccine. So the next one, and one of the earlier ones that were approved is sort of the genetic vaccine, so the nucleic acid vaccines. And so um, Again, a similar concept where we have a, a segment. So it's actually the spike protein um, of the SARS-CoV-2 and um, it's um, introduced, your cells take it up. And then after the vaccine has been taken up, the protein is produced. In this case, the RNA is destroyed. So it doesn't stay in the system. It can't affect your DNA. It's just a delivery mechanism and then it's removed. Your body then goes on to produce, your cells produce these proteins and your um, immune cells see them. And it's the same process of allowing you to build immune memory so you can fight the future infection. So some of the benefits is that it was relatively quick to develop and at low cost just because of the way it's manufactured, but it actually has to be kept in really cold um, storage. So I believe it's minus 80 uh, conditions, which means it tends to be given out in um, scenarios where they've got the refrigeration equipment. So, you know, there's a limitation on where it can go. And that, um, and at use at the moment are the Pfizer and Moderna. Well, actually it's mostly just the Pfizer. And I think later in the year will be the Moderna and um, ones will be available. So another type of vaccine. So the first two vaccines are the ones that are available in the UK and are currently part of the vaccination strategy. The next few slides I'm going to talk about, about other vaccines that may or may not become available sort of either later in the year or as things progress. So the inactivated vaccine, and this is very similar to the flu vaccine that's used routinely, um, contains killed SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so it's got the proteins, it's already been killed, and then this is administered and it is recognised by the immune system that gets a response, but it doesn't cause an illness. And again, it's this idea of building your immune memory so your body can, can fight, fight off 
the invention. So I believe it's in use in other countries at the moment, but it's not here. Another vaccine um, strategy, which will probably be coming out later, is a protein vaccine. So rather than introducing, um, asking the cells to produce the vaccine or introducing a viral vector that asks the cells to produce the vaccine, you um, so produce the protein, you directly introduce the protein that um, itself. So this contains proteins from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And again, similar process triggers the immune response you then get the immune memory that you need. And so this can be whole proteins, fragments, or just lots of different molecules of the protein packed onto nanoparticles. And so this has been shown to have a good previous safety record in other applications. So it's been used for hepatitis B vaccine. Um, and unlike earlier vaccines, what it might need is an adjuvant or sort of a, a, an additional chemical to really help boost the immune response and give you a good, strong immune response. And so um, I believe it was Novavax sort of announced their good efficacy data for this a few weeks, maybe a month ago. And so this is probably another vaccine that's going to be coming into our repertoire strategy for vaccination. And so finally, this is, um, I guess you would argue that this is the sort of strategy that is closest to natural infection. So you take a very weakened version of SARS-CoV-2 virus you introduce this and again it triggers the immune response but it doesn't cause illness and it's the, the strategy is the same for whichever type of vaccine you use that you want to build an immune memory so that when you then come across natural infection you can very promptly react and then minimize the disease from progressing to sort of severe states and so with this approach it um it's, it's more extensive, it takes a long time, um, but it's sort of closest to natural infection. And I guess an example would be the sort of oral polio vaccine. Um, but at the moment, it's the um, viral vectors and it's sort of um, RNA vaccines that are, are currently in use. So that's the vaccines. I guess um, sort of the conversations that come up when I've spoken to other individuals is, how have the vaccines been able to be developed so fast? Should we be concerned that they're available so quickly? And I just kind of put this slide in because I hope it will allay some of those concerns. So obviously COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 when they came out last year really affected all of us. We're still feeling those effects. And um, it sort of prompted a lot of collaboration and it's been prioritized because of the long-term effects. So scientists, doctors, ethics approval boards, manufacturers and sort of regulating agencies have all come together to streamline the processes and work as fast as possible. But I know corners effectively have been cut. It's a case of working efficiently and quickly. The science in terms of vaccine development and technology has been around for many years and has sort of been working in the background for other diseases. So um, it's been easy to repurpose and again proceed relatively quickly because the disease unfortunately and the virus is so prevalent we've got thousands of clinical trial volunteers who've been able to test the vaccine and then they're being tracked by some of the regulatory health effect authorities to see that it works that it's safe and you know that it does what's expected of it and then there's large-scale manufacturing so even within the pharmaceutical um, industry, other pharmaceutical companies are working together to scale up the manufacturing processes so that the vaccine is available as promptly as possible. And because we know the effect, you know, we're in lockdown, there are lots of health and societal burdens through living through this pandemic, the funding has been made available so that barriers are effectively removed and that we can make prompt progress, which we have done, I think to be at the position where large scale vaccination can be happening of a, a virus that was effectively new the year before is really a, a huge testament to, to science and volunteers and really puts us in a much better position this year than the year before. Um, though I'd really kind of like to bring this to a close by saying that I think it's fair to say that the vaccine-based approach is really the way that the pandemic will be brought to an end. 
for most people. Now, that's not to say that SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 will go away because it's likely now that they're endemic. They're part of the sort of roster or rota of viruses that will circulate through the population. So a vaccination strategy will also be around now, probably at least for um, most people as life continues. It does mean, however, that life will go back to closer to normal because the spread of the virus and the disease can be controlled or minimised. So we know that giving the vaccination seems to really kind of minimise severe disease and that's really important. And then also to kind of highlight that all the vaccines that are in use now that people are receiving have been approved by regulatory authorities. They've seen the data, they've you know, done the due diligence, they know that these vaccines are safe that they're effective and most importantly that they work and um i think i just my sort of regular plea is that if you're offered any of the vaccines then i would really strongly urge to sort of take the opportunity to take those vaccines and that's the end like thank you for listening oh thank you so much dami that was really informative and really helpful now we've got lots of questions in the um chat but what i'm going to do is um ask Dr. Kate to do her bit and then we'll combine the questions at the end because I think that would be more helpful to make sure we get through Dr. Kate's bit and I think some of them the answer questions that you can both answer. So Kate, Kate's going to tell us for those of you that joined us late we've had the first um, 20 minutes devoted to telling us exactly what the vaccines are and the next 20 minutes we're going to listen to Dr. Kate who's a microbiologist and she's going to tell us all about testing because they're so many different types of tests. And I think it confuses lots of people, including me. Um, and Kate's going to help us to, <clears throat> to decipher some of that. Thank you, Kate. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, okay. Good. Um, Elizabeth is gonna help me um, share my slides. Um, I'm gonna, it, it's, it's a very uh, brief run through. Um, on the tests that we do in the microbiology lab to identify um, the COVID <clears throat> virus. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> the, um, when we identify viruses in the lab, there are different mechanisms for identifying virus. Some of them are rather um, research-based now, rather than in a normal you know, uh, running lab. Um, we can culture a virus. Um, it is very tricky to culture a virus. You need living cell lines to culture a virus. So when you hear that a virus is being cultured, sometimes they use um, eggs to culture a virus. Sometimes they use you know, embryo um, cells to culture a virus. So you need a live um, cell line to culture a virus. So that is tricky. Um, it's now rarely done um, and only done in research-based uh, situation rather than an ordinary uh, lab. You can also do a microscopy to identify a virus. Now, viruses are some of the tiniest, tiniest living structures, and they're very, very difficult to visualize. So you can't see um, a virus using a normal microscope. You need um, a, a, a huge magnification to be able to see a virus. And the type of microscope that we use uh, to visualize a virus is called the electron microscope. Now, an electron microscope is now um, kind of like restricted for research rather than for ordinary use um, is a huge, huge, huge machinery. And uh, you need like a huge big room to occupy one um, electron microscope. And we hardly ever do that in, 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 in the lab now. We don't have an electron microscope uh, in our lab. Um, another or method for identifying the virus is serology, where you actually take a blood sample for the patient from a patient or from an individual, and you want to check whether that blood sample has got, you know, um, antigens um, or antibodies. And um, 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 uh, but what I'm going to be talking about mainly today um, are what we do uh, the lateral flow test and PCR. Uh, the lateral flow test is uh, a, a method uh, of detecting an antigen in a patient sample. We'll move on to the next slide, please. So 
A lateral flow test, simply put, is when two components interact to produce a color change that you can visualize. I think the commonest example of a lateral flow test that everybody probably knows is the pregnancy test or the pregnancy kits that people can do at home to check whether they're pregnant or not. Now it's used, this, this type of, um, of testing for, for things is used for a wide range of things. Uh, so it's not unique to um, the COVID-19 uh, virus. You can use it to test for com contaminants in water. You can use it to test a patient's or, or somebody's uh, blood for drugs, whether they've got drugs in their blood system. You can use it for different types of viruses in, in the lab um, uh, scenario. We use it daily for different types of bacteria. But when we use it for the COVID-19, what we're doing is combining the viral protein, which is known as the antigen, with antibody that's already present in the kit. And I'm gonna show you a picture of the kit. And it produces a color change that you can then see and interpret as to whether the sample is positive or negative. Um, you take a throat swab or a nose swab or sometimes a saliva. You add that into a liquid known as a buffer. You shake that sample very well. And then you add it to the kit. I can't see my slide anymore. Elizabeth, anyway. can you put the slides back up, please? I think she's been kicked out. Oh, by who? I'll see if I can <laughs> share my slide myself. Uh, I'm going to try. Okay, thank you, Kate. <laughs> Hopefully I can. Oops. It is, oh dear. <clears throat> um, I have no idea. I was using my laptop, but my laptop <laughs> got switched off and I borrowed my husband's laptop and I can't use this laptop. Oh, uh, don't worry, Elizabeth's back now. I could just, you can just anyway, chat to us about what. Yeah, what, I'll what just chat. Yeah, we'll I'll you. just chat to you about it. Okay, so <laughs> Elizabeth, could you move on to the next one, please? Thank you. Yeah, so this is a photo of what the lateral flow test uh, looks like. If you haven't seen it before, so that's the swab that goes into your. Uh, nose, the back of your nose or your throat or, or, or some other um, kids use saliva. So you could just um, use your saliva rather than a, a, a swab. Um, it goes into the test tube and you add the liquid um, into the test tube, mix it very well together. And the sample then goes into the hole that's labeled uh, S. That's where the sample goes. And um, the interact, or rather, the sample travels down the pad, and it interacts with antibodies. So the sample already contains the virus. If it's positive, it will contain, you know, protein material known as the antigen from the virus. It will interact with antibodies that are already attached to um, 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 the pad inside the kit. And when they interact, there will be a color change that you can see. And it's usually a pink line or a blue line. Um, if it's one line that's come up positive, it just shows that the kit itself is working. So that's the control. It's known as the control. Um, if no line appears at all, then that kit is defective. You need to throw that away and use another one. But when you then see two lines, the one that says T, if, that, if you see a line there and you see another line, where it says control, two lines will indicate that that sample is positive for uh, the virus. 
So that's the, um, um, basically that's the principle or that's the way that the lateral flow test works. And, um, is, and that's how it's used for um, um, the coronavirus. Next slide, please. The government has spent a lot of money buying a lot and lot of lateral flow uh, kits. And there is a reason for that. They're hoping that by using this test, which is very, very simple to perform, you can do it in a lab situation. You can also do it, you know, in a community situation, sort of like in shopping malls and what have you. They did um, um, sort of a community-based test of lots and lots of people in Liverpool, shopping malls and all that. Um, so the government injected a lot of money into buying this kit. And the idea is that you can identify people who have the coronavirus really quickly and then take action as to self-isolate or, or treat them as the case may be if they are symptomatic. And the one that the government injected a lot of money into is known as the Innova Lateral Flow. That's a, an American-based company um, that supplied lots and lots of, 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 of the kit. And the reason they went with this one is because they tested a whole range of them, over 40 of them, and they came up with four that they thought were good. And this is one of the best ones that will come up positive if a patient sample is put in and is actually positive and is performed properly, then 79% of them will be true positives. Having said that, if somebody who's not experienced does it, then the positivity rate actually goes down because you can be given this kit and be asked to take it home and perform it on yourself. And what we have noticed is that when you give it to say students in a university setting, the positivity rate can actually like be very, very, very low, sometimes 3%. <laughs> so some of the kids are better than others, but this is the best of the ones that were tested. So the government injected a lot of money into this. But for the sample to be positive, most of the positive uh, samples will occur between one to three days before symptoms actually appear. And then they remain positive within seven days of symptoms. So if somebody is asymptomatic, they can still be positive, but the positivity rate in that case is usually pretty, pretty low. So it's low in people who are carriers and not showing any symptoms. It is higher in people who are about to show symptoms between one to three days before symptoms appear. And it is even more positive when they are actually symptomatic. Now, the, there is a danger in allowing people to perform it themselves at home because they might just assume, oh, my test is negative so I can go about you know, my life as though I'm negative, whereas they might actually be uh, positive. Um, and the reason that it is not usually positive in such situations is because the sample is not properly taken or the interpretation is a bit vague and they can't really understand it, but it should really be better at the more you perform the test on yourself. So you will get a lot of uh, kids to perform it on yourself at home, especially healthcare workers or people who work at schools and things like that. Um, going forward will be given this to perform it for themselves at home. And the idea is that the more you do it, the more confident you become and the positivity rate will increase with time. Let's move on to the next slide. What are the advantages of the lateral flow test or the lateral flow device? It is very, very easy to perform. You get the result within 15 to 30 minutes. You don't need any sophisticated lab equipment to do it. And anybody can do it practically, but you get better the more you do it. Uh, it is cheap. Some of them are as cheap as seven pounds, going up to about 23 pounds per kit. And like I said, it can be performed by the patient themselves. It can be performed by the patient's bedside in a large group of people in a community, in a school setting. So you can do it practically anywhere. So that's, those are the, the, the advantages. But the disadvantages are that you can get false negatives. You can get falsely reassured that your result is negative. Let's go party because I am negative but you might actually still be carrying the virus. So um, the false 
negative rate is pretty high, 60% in some cases, which is very, very, very high. Next slide, please. I don't even, yeah. Um, I'm, I was, I was going to sort of emphasize the fact that I think going forward, when things start to reopen, this the lateral flow test will probably be a lot more common um, in uh, community settings, uh, schools, universities. We're already using them for healthcare workers. Uh, in hospitals, nurses and doctors have the kit at home where they can perform it on themselves every two days. And if they are negative, then they go into work. If they are positive, we still need to confirm that test using a PCR. So you get a positive test, you still need to get that sample performed um, or, 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 or confirmed on a PCR-based platform. So what is PCR? It's actually a biotechnology that De detects um, the genetic material in a virus, not just the virus, but we use it for bacteria, we use it for humans. So any kind of DNA can be done on a PCR platform. So what does the PCR platform actually do? So the reaction happens where we get a segment of a genetic material and this reaction is meant to multiply the segment of a genetic material lots and lots of times using um, a special technology and using reagents and, and, and a special automated machine. So the sample um, goes onto the machine and if the sample contains genetic material from the virus, then no matter how small that genetic material is, this PCR platform is able to harness this genetic material and make lots and lots of copies of the virus. So in one cycle, we call them cycles. So it goes through one cycle, it produces two copies of the genetic material from the original material. Then it goes through another cycle and it doubles what has already been um, um, uh, replicated. And then it goes on to up to 40 cycles for the COVID virus. <coughs> And by the time it reaches 40 cycles, it's made millions and millions of copies of that virus. And we can say that, you know, the patient is positive, whether it is a tiny little bit of genetic material that the patient has. Now, this test can take between one to six hours. We have different platforms for P PCRs. There are some platforms that can produce results from 4,000 samples in a day. And there are some platforms that can do just one sample within an hour. In our hospital, we have both, and we tend to use them for different um, scenarios. Let's say we have, during the height of the COVID season, we were receiving thousands and thousands of samples from the community and everywhere. So we needed a platform that can generate a lot of samples or pro process a lot of samples at the same time. So there is a machine that <clears throat> produces about 4,000 results in a day, but that takes a whole day before you can get a result and sometimes takes a whole lot more. When we first started, we didn't have the machine at all. We had to send all our samples to either London or Manchester, but most you know, local labs now have their own PCR platform that can process, you know, um, the, the uh, COVID-19. Uh, but then there is one that does the sample within an hour. And the reason for that is because sometimes we need a quick decision as to where to put a patient. If a patient is symptomatic, is this COVID or is this something else? So in a hospital setting, you need one that can give you a result really quickly. But we can't completely rely on a lateral flow test that is a 15 minutes test, we still need to confirm using a PCR. So we need one that can give us a result very, very quickly. And the one hour one we use for making quick decisions. Whereas if we need to produce mass, mass uh, results, we use um, one that gives us about 4,000 uh, results in a day. Next one. Next slide, please. So the advantages of PCR is that it's very, very accurate. 
and is our standard for confirming whether somebody is negative or positive. Like it's, it will pick up the minutest amount of viral material that's present in a patient's sample, up to 99% in some cases, no matter how small or tiny the material is, because the machine and the reagents are able to produce, it's like a photocopying machine. It just produces a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, viral copies from the smallest amount. So it is a very, very um, sensitive way to detect the virus. Having said that, you can, or rather the, the false positive rate is pretty low because it's usually, uh, a platform that matches the exact genetic material that's present in the virus. So you can't get it, you know, uh, if it's positive, then it's a true positive because it's usually 100% accurate. The equipment is very, very expensive. Not every lab can, you know, uh, purchase the equipment. Most NHS labs will have some form of PCR platform or the other. They might have the big one, but most labs will at least have the small one that can give you a result within an hour. And um, that process is about one sample in an hour. So it takes a long time, but most labs will have that if they don't have the, the bigger platform that produces mass, mass amounts of results. Um, I'm just thinking back to uh, developing countries and the fact that most labs in the developing countries will not have a PCR platform because of the expense of the equipment and the reagents. And the staff who do this need very, very thorough training because lots of things can go wrong in a, in a PCR platform. For instance, if you pick, um, if you contaminate the worktop or the environment with genetic material that's, you know, COVID-19, and then you pick it up, then you can falsely, you know, um, label people as positive. So people need to be properly trained as to how to use the equipment, how to decontaminate the equipment, and how to make sure that there is no cross-contamination so that you don't wrongly label somebody as positive when they are actually meant to be negative. And uh, there is a time factor as well. The, the disadvantage is that you, you can't get a result in 15 to 30 minutes like you will um, using the lateral flow. False positives are also a problem because the, um, I, I did say that if, if a patient, you have to interpret it properly. If a patient is positive and has symptoms that suggest that that patient is got COVID, regardless of whether the PCR is negative or not, the clinical um, decision or the clinical picture always trumps a lab result, okay? The, prop, the scenarios where we have false positive is where there is contamination or where the patient is, um, is had COVID before, but the viral material still hangs on. And we can't tell the difference between whether the patient is actually actively infected or whether this is dead virus because PCR can also pick dead um, genetic material and it can be positive. So in that scenario, what we say to the clinician is, if a patient is still got symptoms suggestive of COVID, then treat them as though they are still COVID positive. Um, but we don't expect people to be positive two weeks down the line. If a patient is had COVID and then two weeks down the line, they are still positive, then you need to interpret the results with caution because it may be dead virus that's hanging about. Um, false negatives are rare because if, 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 it's, if, it's, if it's negative, then it's a true negative. It's a very expensive test to perform because it costs about 200 pounds at least to perform one a PCR sample. If you do lots and lots of sample, the test, the test uh, cost goes down. But for the most part, it's a very expensive test to perform because the equipment is expensive and the reagents are expensive as well. So PCR is um, very accurate, produces accurate results, can give you really false positives 
but you have to interpret the positive result with caution because rarely is it a false positive if a patient is clinically symptomatic. Um, and you also have to make sure that your lab staff are properly trained so that they do not contaminate a sample and call a patient positive when in actual fact, fact the patient is negative. So you always have to go back to the symptoms. Now, a PCR platform is able to pick people who are carrying the virus and are not symptomatic at all. So if you wanted to accurately identify people who are carrying, carrying the virus asymptomatically, then a PCR platform is your best bet for that rather than the lateral flu. Um, I think that's the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Kate. That was really interesting. So I've got lots of questions. Um, and what I'll do, I'll just start with, since we've still got your, your um, we're still talking about the testing. In the PCR testing, are there any viruses that cross-react so that you might get a positive test when actual fact you're negative for COVID? No, the, there are no viruses that cross-react because what we do for PCR is that we have specific primers. So the segment of the genetic material that we are replicating is actually unique to the COVID virus. So there is no virus that cross-reacts with uh, the COVID-19, no. And the ones that they want to introduce into the airports, because there's some areas where they're doing testing airports, so I presume those are lateral flow tests from what you've described. There will be lateral flow tests, and I guess there will also be the simple, there are some simple PCR uh, platforms where um, just anybody with very minimal training can perform. Those are small machines that you, you can use to confirm a true positive, but I'm guessing that in the airports, it will be lateral flow because it only takes about uh, 15 to 30 minutes. But if there is a positive, they will need to confirm it using a PCR platform. But the important thing is that if it's negative, doesn't it really mean because doesn't really mean that you're not infected because you said that there was only in the best of hands it was eighty percent and if you do it yourself it's about fifty percent. So yes. we still need to take precautions if we're be, if people are being tested at airports. Exactly. So if you get tested using the lateral flow test, you shouldn't you know just say it's a license for me to now go and mingle freely because I am negative because you can still be a carrier because as we saw the positivity rate is highest when you're one to two days before symptoms so if you are like a completely asymptomatic carrier you might not be picked up so you still need to take all the precautions because you might still be positive okay and for schools because we've been hearing a lot about teachers and pupils that when they go back to schools they plan to do mass testing with lateral flow tests when they go back to school. So this again is a warning that if you are doing testing, lateral flow, even if you get a negative result, if you're not feeling well, you should probably check that out with the PCR. Exactly. I think the, the, the benefit of doing it is that you, you get to do it every so often. So it's not like a once and for all test. You, you, you do it every two days. And the idea is that when, if you are gonna be symptomatic, then it's going to come up positive, say one to two days before you're actually symptomatic. And that is when the viral load is the highest and that is when you're likely to transmit. So as soon as it becomes positive, you stay away from school or from wherever, from big gatherings. So the idea is to keep doing the test. And if it is positive, you stay away because at that point you are more likely to transmit the virus. Thank you. Dr. Dami. There are a number of questions about the contents of the, of the vaccine. That was a really, really nice explanation of what they all are. But I think there are still some concerns about what's in it and whether what's what the the, the emollients that are, the vaccines are put in are safe. So, have you got any? If, can you explain that? What what are the, the carriers for the vaccine and whether that's safe for us to take? So, um, I don't have to take the approach that I've not. I'm not a vaccinologist. I can't go into the, the actual specifics of what's in um, the individual pro uh, vaccines. And I suspect at the moment, some of them might be under proprietary information, but I can say that certainly in terms of the AstraZeneca virus, 
it's um they use a, a viral vector so it's an existing virus i think it's like a, a virus that, co- that causes the cold in the chin so it doesn't affect humans it doesn't make us sick but they then put in like the protein material from the sars cov virus and then that's administered and then it's taken up by your cells so it's a biological process whereby they're taken up and your cells start producing the protein for a period of time and then your immune response um raises itself to um, the protein that it's exposed to. And then similarly for the um, Moderna and Pfizer that they take um, sort of RNA from sort of the spike protein and then that's introduced and it's taken up the protein produced and then the, the actual um, mode of transfer is destroyed. So it doesn't affect your cell, like it doesn't affect your DNA. It doesn't stay long term, but it, it's present long enough so that your cells can produce the protein that your immune response then needs in order to to work and be trained okay because there's a number of concerns about the dna yeah um because is any um benefit over the viral vector method and the dna method because the dna has caused so many concerns that i guess there are people out there that will say i would just prefer to have the the method the viral vector yeah so i think my kind of caveat is always to take whichever vaccine is offered because the protection is what's key. And then certainly from the literature and what we know, I think you could argue that actually the viral vaccines work very well and seem to be very safe and seem to be well tolerated. And so there's kind of different framings because as I'm sure you're aware that currently we're going through a two dose regimen and there's a spacing and it seems that maybe the AstraZeneca virus does very well with the, the spacing because of the type of back, the modal delivery. Uh, whereas certainly the, um, the pharmaceutical companies that developed the um, uh, sort of RNA vaccines would, be, would prefer that the strategy was kept sort of three week spacing. But um, so that's kind of their argument. I would also say that with the AstraZeneca vaccine, because of the way it's designed, so you're, you're, you're taking a virus that has the protein in and you're given. And so you actually end up with two different immune responses, one to the viral protein that you're interested in, so the SARS-CoV spike protein, and then another reaction actually to the viral vector, which means that after you have it the second time, you start to react to that vector. And it's not been shown yet, but there's always kind of a worry that you might that might actually have some effect as well on your your sort of overall immunity, but not enough to like sort of stop the immunity. It's just that you wouldn't then be able to take a third dose of that vaccine, not that you would be offered it anyway. So oh, I know it sounds quite concerning and it, there's, a, there's a lot of scientific sort of literature or scientific knowledge to understand behind it, but the RNA vaccines have been designed for a lot of time. So there's been about 20 years of technology there and they've been shown to be safe and they've been shown not to have an effect on the DNA and they've been shown to be really effective. So I would feel confident taking either type of vaccine. I think at some point I will be offered either vaccine because of like um, being in a group that needs to be vaccinated and I will happily take whichever vaccine is offered to me first. Okay. There are questions about, um, I've had the virus and, you know, at the beginning of your presentation, you started out by talk telling us um, how you get natural immunity. Yeah. So this is a question from a number of people who have had COVID-19 infections. Yeah. So why should they take the, va- the, the vaccine? So the kind of conversation around the natural infection is that we don't know how long it lasts. And we also don't know how effective that protection is in addition to how long it lasts. So we don't know if you if you have the virus, it's likely if it takes after other coronaviruses such as common colds, then within a year, within 18 months, you probably won't have the level of immunity you need to keep you safe. So it is definitely recommended that even if you've had prior exposure, you should take the vaccine when offered because it will give you the kind of prevention the kind of protection you need and there's also although it's rare you are liable to reinfection because obviously we know there are a number of variants doing the rounds so I would argue that getting vaccinated getting vaccinated again is just you know a very 
good way of keeping yourself safe and making sure that you've got the best available protection. And then sort of the other thing that we're finding as well, as more data is coming out, is that the, the vaccines are important for stopping transmission. So we're beginning to see evidence that you can break the transmission chains and that people who've been infected, because originally when the vaccines came out, we knew that they stopped people progressing to the severe disease and possible death. But we did know if they stopped you actually transmitting the infection to other individuals. And now it looks like, yes, that's also an effect of vaccination. But if you take the um, vaccine, you can then stop transmission chains. You can, you can stop the infection from spreading. So I would definitely recommend, even if you've already had the infection, if you're offered a vaccine, I would recommend taking it. Thank you. Variants. That's a really good time to bring in Dr. Kate again. Now, all these tests that you've described to us, um, how do they recognize different variants? Now, to recognize, I mean, you can make a PCR platform and choose any segment of the virus that you want replicated. And if you know uh, the genomic sequence of any virus, you can make a PCR flat platform to detect that virus. So when we have a variant, and we know the, the, the genomic sequence, then we, we make a target in our PCR platform to be able to pick that specific variant. So yes, we can tell by PCR when we have a specific variant and we can tell whether it's a South African variant or you know the, uh, the British variant or, or whichever variant it is, we, we can pick it up using our, pla uh, our platform. Now, not everybody might have the target, the specific target in their lab. So if you know that you don't have a target to pick up the South African variant, you have to look for a reference lab that does it. At the moment, my lab doesn't have the platform to pick the South African variant. So if we have a, a patient coming from South Africa or the other day we have somebody coming from Brazil, we send that patient sample to Manchester because it's the reference, the nearest reference lab to us. And they're able to tell us within a day or two whether it is the South African variant or you know, the, 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 the South American variant. So this chap from Brazil, if he yeah. hadn't told you that he was from Brazil, when you did his test in the lab, what results would you have got? Now, we, if they hadn't told us that they were um, um, uh, from Brazil, we will still pick up that it is COVID positive. Okay. Because the, the, the sequence uh, that our lab test picks is, 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 um, is is present in all the, um, the COVID virus. So whichever variant will have that sequence, it's a, it's, it's a generic sequence that's found in all the, the COVID-19. But then to be able to say specifically that this sample is, is the South African variant or the South American variant, we have to send it somewhere. In actual fact, the sample was positive in our lab. So we then sent the sample to Manchester to say, you know, can you tell us whether it is, you know, the South African or, or the, Brazil, the, the, the Brazilian variant? Yeah. So is it possible that there are other variants that we just don't know about? That oh, there are. There are so many variants. At the moment, we are standing at almost 1,200 variants. Some of the variants oh. are major and some are very minor that don't, you know, make any difference. But well, some of the variants make the virus more transmissible. Some of it make the virus more um, dangerous in terms of its virulence. Uh, and there are different, different, different types of variant, but some of them are insignificant because it doesn't make the virus do anything different. But we have over 1,200 variants at the moment. Oh my word, that sounds a bit scary. I must say, I was expecting that answer. <laughs> There's another question about, we're, we're all going to get vac vaccinated. And you remember the, the little boxes you showed us with all the people and how we're all going to get out of this. Do you think, Dami, that we're going to have to have this annually? Yeah, I and, think- Sorry, just before you continue. And if we are, do you think we're all going to have the same vaccine annually? So if I started off with Pfizer, does it mean I have to have Pfizer next year again? Or what, what do you think? I know this is just an opinion because there's no policy on this yet, but it would be helpful. 
yeah, with your so I, immunology background to explain it? I think, um, as you say, like with the, the variants are obviously sort of circulating and that's a pretty large number that we see here. And then I guess you will expect there's a, just a large number kind of globally. It makes sense that there'll be some kind of routine annual vaccination program, either booster um, or yeah, so booster or other type of vaccination, just because of the way that herd immunity works. So for instance, the population dynamic isn't necessarily fixed. You'll have people who sadly will pass away and they'll take their immunity with them. You'll have people who are born who are, don't have any immunity. And then you'll have the kind of the competing pressure of the actual changes in the viruses as it undergoes just standard mutation because it, it'll always mutate as it kind of goes through the population. So I think probably there'll be some kind of, in a similar way to the flu virus mutates annually, there'll be like a new um, vaccination strategy. And I think that the important thing to remember is if it's sort of going to be a, a long-term issue, that means there's going to be constant work on vaccines. So flu vaccines don't stop. New ones are designed each year because of a new variant. And so it's a similar approach that there'll probably be new vaccines sort of with each year and even towards the end of the year I think at least two other vaccines are likely to come out so I don't think it will necessarily be that you have the same vaccine each year but I think you'll probably depending on your circumstances depending on the circumstances required for the population immunity be offered a vaccine annually and then it's kind of you know as each iteration happens it, they will improve so vaccination is quite good now you know it will only kind of get better as time continues. Okay, thank you. We've got a hand up um, question. Um, Shade, would you like to ask your question? Uh, can you unmute Shade? Elizabeth? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Oh, well, um, can I just commend you all for this um, talk? It's been very, very enlightening and um, yeah, I learned a lot, but I'm asking on behalf of someone how safe is the vaccine for somebody who is routinely on immunosuppressant drugs? Would you recommend it or would you say there's any kind of danger to the person? That's a, a good question and sort of really I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable kind of giving medical advice. I think it's sort of the approach you'd need to discuss with your um, sort of medical practitioner. Um, so it's kind of complicated to, to kind of give an answer. But I think personally, I would take the approach of if I was in a scenario where the vaccine was a safe option for me and it was the best option for me, then I would I would take it if it was recommended. If yeah, I, I think that's the... I think, uh, the, I think the, the current guidance is that yeah. even if you're immunosuppressed or pregnant, um, you can still have the vaccine because it is not a live vaccine. Um, the, 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 the two vaccines or the three that are licensed certainly right now in the UK are not live vaccines. So they are unlikely to give you the actual COVID infection. And it is recommended that even the immunocompromised can have it and patients on steroids can have it. At least certainly that's what we're advising patients in the hospital to do. We are giving everybody um, the, the, the vaccine uh, regardless of whether they are immunocompromised or not. Now, the the um, the contraindication is if you have had any side effects whatsoever to the components of the vaccine, particularly the ethyl 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 glycol that's um, that's contained in the Pfizer vaccine or if you had had the first vaccine and you had any reaction to it, then suddenly you shouldn't go for the second one. But if you're immunocompromised, you can still have it. There's a question again on um, reactions to vaccine. There's um, a question that, or a comment that they've had severe reactions to erythromycin um, and reactions to nystatin. Should they take the vaccine? The vaccine doesn't contain any antibiotic, no erythromycin, no penicillin, nothing. Um, and it also doesn't contain nystatin, no antifungal in it. So there is no cross reaction with these two. Um, and the, like I said, the, the only um, um, contraindication is if you have had a, a reaction to 
the liquid component that's contained in in the in the vaccine, which is actually present in a lot of other vaccines as well. So if you have had a reaction to a previous vaccine, you might need to ask whether it, the same component is in this vaccine and be careful with the, you know, get advice on whether you should go ahead and have the vaccine. But if you erythromycin, nystatin, there's no cross reaction as far as the vaccine is concerned, doesn't contain these two. And there's also a question where um, a lady has had the vaccine and um, this was just after she had her period. Um, her periods are now late and she's got a pain in, um, in her chest and she's worried whether this was the result of the vaccine. A late period is unlikely <laughs> going to be due to the vaccine. There is no reason why the vaccine should make you have late periods. And even the infection itself, as far as I know, does not affect you know, your um, reproductive system in any way. Um, so you might need to go seek uh, medical advice as to why you're having late periods rather than you know, assume that it is the vaccine. Um, what was the other thing she had? What was the other side effect? Um, tenderness in her breasts, which is all, I think we need another PCR test, another sort of PCR test maybe. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would certainly go and get herself checked and <laughs> make sure you're not pregnant. <laughs> exactly, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Sounds very much like pregnancy to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the saga of the COVID vaccinations and COVID per se is going to go on for quite some time. So I'd just like to say thank you so much to Dr. Kate and Dr. Dami. I think we might have you back again in the future if you can. We're just over uh, the six minutes, um, six minutes over time. Is there anyone else that has any burning questions? I think that we have answered most of the questions in the chat. But I would also like to say that the report on the um, program we did on the 16th of January is now out and that has been put in the chat. You can follow the links to that report. Um, it's very comprehensive and answered all the, has, has got the details of the questions that were asked on the day and also the follow-up questions that people put to us. So thank you so much again for giving up your Saturday um, afternoon to our speakers and those of you that have joined us. Thank you and have a good rest of the day. I think, I think it goes before our speakers and, and yourself go, you know, they had the vaccine and, you know, what was and if there was any reaction. You can start, Charles. You've had it. Go on, as a pastor, you can tell us all how you found it. <laughs> well, I, I went for my vaccine on on su Sunday afternoon, and I, I it, it was okay. But then from Monday morning, I was having two ibuprofen tablets in the morning and two in the you know evening, and you know did that for pretty much all week. But apart from you know a bit of temperature and uh, slight headache, you know I have been fine. So you know that was my reaction and and you know it made it made me feel that you know there's something working in my body you know i was just gonna say your immune system's it's fantastic working. And it's yeah. working <laughs> Great. i've had my vaccine and um i must say i was a bit disappointed when they made the um the length of time between the two vaccines longer because i'm a scientist the way it was developed meant that it had a defined period of time between the two vaccines but, but did also, you know did you know now they're saying that it it actually might be of an advantage to have it have it spaced I've heard, out longer I've heard <laughs> but what convinced me was the arguments about um the greater good and big society really because yeah. if you're going to have one person who's um 100% immune and another person who's 0% immune then that's not right yeah. if you can get two people who are 70% immune then that's what I would I felt I should go for. So I've had my first one. I've got my second one coming up in four weeks. Um, I've had my are there any eight, any over seventies here that would like to say? Because there's a problem I think with the elderly. Some elderly people don't want to come forward. So if any elderly person would like to tell us about their experience of having the vaccine, anybody over the age of seventy five, Elaine's iPad. <laughs> <laughs> I must tell you, I had my vaccine and I did not have 
anything wrong with me after, not even a scratch. <laughs> you would not even know I had the vaccine. I've felt fantastic since I've had it. So that is an experience I'd like to share with everybody. Yes. Thank and you, Mum. That means I can come round soon. <laughs> yes. I had I had it also. Um, I'm over seventy. I had it also, and it's been fine. No. Thank reaction you so at all. much, yeah, Christine. I'm, I'm yes. seventy-seven, and I'm waiting for mine to happen. Okay. Have you been called up yet? Uh, yes. Okay. So you'll be soon. I think it's really important for uh, the elder in our society to get the vaccine because you're in the vulnerable group. Yeah. And yeah. so it's really important that you are. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. I think that this will have um, helped some people who are listening in today yeah. to make sure that they know that our elderly are having it and they're all safe. I am 80 and I had mine. I had no, nothing at all, no problem. Only a few pain on my uh, left hand. And since then, I'm okay. I didn't even take any paracetamol. I was just okay. And I'm 80 years old. Wow. Thank, thank you. You don't look it. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Dr. Kate, Dr. Charles, Dr. Do you have any reaction? Kate, have you had it? I've had it. I just had mild pain in my arm. Um, I didn't even need paracetamol for it. So, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Any final words, Charles? No, I'm, I'm asking if Dr. Dummy has had a vaccine. No, I, I'm, saying, I'm sitting here slightly envious. I have not had it, although I've just found out that I'm now in a new like group of people who need to have it. So as soon as I can have it, I will be in that queue like to get my vaccine. Great. Fair, fair, thanks for that. So, you know, yeah, we, we're really delighted, you know, for your time and, and for breaking down, you know, because I, you know, I've been promoting this. We've been, you know, getting, you know, the word out there, but it was good to see the different, you know, uh, test kits, but also, you know, Dr. Dummy, great to see, you know, you talking to us in layman's language about mm -hmm. community herd immunity and all that. So that's, you know, really brilliant. And, and thanks, you know, as ever, Dr you know, in Gozi as well for facilitating that. I, I know we have something planned for next week. So, you know, Dr. Ngozi, I'm sure you would let us know because you have a lineup of, you know, various speakers coming up. But the other thing to mention is, please refer to our, you know, report at the vaccines report. We've spent a lot of time on that. Dr. Ngozi has been through that. We've had other external people, you know, review that as well. There, there are various cues and aid there about fertility, immunity, you know, even the faith aspect and people saying, God is my vaccine and some response to that from some pastors in there. So please refer to the report, download it, share it with your friends. But I think what would be good is we, we've created an email address called storiesaccount.org.uk. And want to encourage people, you know, when you go for your vaccine and you want to share, you know, the reaction, we will, you know, have a collection of video suites that we can, you know, share with, with, with the community. Because I think the biggest issue we have on our hand now, uh, you know, is, is a challenge with some of our frontline nurses and doctors, you know, declining the vaccine. And then they are in a really critical position. And I was on a national call yesterday, well, no, last Friday. And of the seven nurses that died that week, six of them were from Black and Asian, you know, community. So there, there, there are some still real issues. We're not out of it yet. So we're even encouraging after you've had the vaccine, you know, still to keep looking after yourself, hands, face, face, you know, until you've had the second dose and until we've known more about the immunity levels. So please, please, you know, still keep looking after yourself. We will be launching shortly, you know, vitamin D campaign. All our consultants have, and doctors have been talking about vitamin D. If you don't have one yet, you know, try and get one. Else we'll be making, for those who live in Manchester, we'll be making available free packs. It will have a pouch of vitamin D. I think it's a 2000 unit strength and and you know free face mark hand sanitizer and some leaflet you know information leaflets in there so please if you interested in that drop us an email info at uk. and then finally on the back of the event we organized you know we, we uh, and other partners are planning a big national event you know it might be the first or second week you know of March <coughs> an 
evening. So we'll try and get, you know, our, our black doctors to come on again and, and just offer some reassurance. Because what we're hoping to do is to get the reports to shift the converse, conversation we're having now. We understand the historic issues and the lack of trust. We understand how people have been treated. But as a community, we hear it now. And, and we need to be making that important decision about looking after ourselves and looking after our loved ones. And, and you know, having Kate, you know, Dami and Ngozi others to offer us reassurance that we've all had the vaccine, it's safe. So let's go for it as a community so we can protect ourselves. So we just want to thank everyone. And, you know, the video from today will be available on our YouTube channel. We live stream all this. So share it with your friends and those who weren't able to make it. And we look forward to seeing you next, next week. Next which week. is an ENT um, consultant, Dr. Yakubu Karagama, who's going to tell us all about the ENT complications and long COVID. Yeah, and then, and, and, you know, Dr. Yakubo works at St. Guy's and Thomas's, where our prime minister was admitted, you know, so he, he's seen some of those cases. And yeah, so please don't miss that. Okay. Uh, Thanks, thank everyone. you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Charles. Thank you.